Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 63 of Ask the CEO with Avraham Gatile. Today, I'd like to introduce a very special guest. He is an award-winning business driver, account hunter, and servant leader who's led a very successful career in professional services and high-tech environments. Previously, he held leadership positions in professional services management, systems engineering solutions delivery, program implementation and large-scale budgeting with Centrify Corporation, AT&T Wireless, and other high-tech firms in the U.S. and Canada. He built and led multifunctional teams through practice startup, sales, support, and IT operations. He also served as chairman of the eight-person executive board with the 5th Legislative District, representing 300,000 voters in Washington State between 2004 and 2006. In addition, he is an industry expert in cybersecurity. It's my pleasure to welcome Kane McGladry. Welcome, Kane. Avram, thanks for having me on the show. I need to have you do all my introductions. <laughs> thanks so much for joining. It's a real pleasure to do this introduction. And talking about cybersecurity, given your experience, your vast experience in cybersecurity, what are the most pressing threats to businesses nowadays? So I, I think there's a couple real threats. There's an obvious threat and then there's a non-obvious threat. And I, I want to kind of go after them in, in, in that two-pronged approach. So the obvious threat that we're seeing right now today is the, uh, the abuse and the takeover of privileged insider credentials during concerted attacks. A lot of what we're seeing in the industry right now really uh, resembles what you'd see as, as tradecraft in a military sense where a threat actor will compromise uh, a privileged insider account, but they'll do it as part of a larger coordinated smokescreen attack. So for your average IT or your average uh, security operations center, they might have a distributed denial of service attack going on. They might have a virus attack going on. They might have a phishing campaign that they're intercepting. And that's a really bad day at the office. And at some point in that day in the office, uh, Sudakar is going to log into the finance server. And because everybody knows Sudakar, he just sits down the hallway after all. He's a good solid guy. Nobody's going to think anything of that. The SIM is not going to alert on that. Uh, and the challenge there is that it's not Sudakar sitting down the hall. It's some dude sitting on the other side of the planet who has compromised that user's root account or their Active Directory uh, credentials or their administrator credentials. And so any of those operations, because it's just already a bad day at the office, Nobody notices till, you know, 60, 90, 120 days later is what we're seeing in these dwell time reports where they realize that was actually an insider breach. The other challenge that I see really with cybersecurity beyond the um, account takeovers of privileged credentials is the way that we think about and the way that we talk about cybersecurity. I think that one of the challenges that we're seeing, especially in recruiting for cybersecurity, is that we're not... Um, we're not doing a good job at attracting a lot of diverse individuals into the profession. And I say that based on a Kaspersky report that came out just late last year, uh, despite what the federal government has said about Kaspersky, their research report is accurate in that only 11% of uh, cybersecurity positions worldwide are held by women. And that's just looking at, at the binary individuals. If you go out to non-binary identifying individuals, you actually get a, an even more um, appalling more. view of who we have actually working in cybersecurity. And so I think that the challenge there is that the way we talk about cybersecurity, the way that we talk in terms of threats and in terms of uh, tactics, we're, we might not be having the right conversation even, right? Because there's obviously an economic challenge that we currently face. I think it was uh, Vice President at AT&T Wireless said this is going to be the, one of the greatest transfers of wealth in human history. Uh, and what he was referring to was how threat actors are monetizing things. And the challenge that I have with that is Take, for example, the phrase bad guy, right? Let's, let's talk about a single mother in an impoverished country who works in a call center doing ransomware service. This is actually a job posting that exists, right? She's a bad she's got, gal. 
<laughs> yeah, how do you even say that that's bad necessarily? Because she's putting food on the table for her kids. There are underlying economic and social issues that are probably far past my purview to talk about from a technical perspective, but there is a vast underreported and underrepresented uh, portion of the conversation that we're all missing by always chasing the latest threat, the latest trend, What's driving these behaviors is actually, I think, more important to look at from a policy and strategic level. Interesting. So the two things you talked about was, number one, uh, the breach the co- where the, the individual was compromised. So that really boils down to a human problem, not a technology problem. And then the second thing that you mentioned, I think that goes hand in hand, is the fact that there isn't enough diversity because these bad guys or bad gals out there, they're studying us. They know our psychology. They know what our vulnerabilities are. And the more like-minded people you hire, well, guess what? You're just adding to the same vulnerability, and which is why diversity is so important. Exactly. And I've found that really um, today, there's a lot of talk about threat intelligence and about building intelligence programs. Um, I've, over the course of my career, hired a lot of veterans who have served our country in the intelligence services and in other, uh, other divisions. And their version of intelligence is far different than what a lot of um, companies are pur- or, or purveyors of threat intelligence are saying, yeah, buy our product or buy our solution, right? It's a, it's a CSV file of IP addresses that were bad yesterday, right? Um, I met a veteran from, uh, who, who served in the Iraq war and he was talking about improvised uh, explosive devices, IEDs. And the conversation, in the course of the conversation, he talked about how not only did they have to disarm the IED, but they also had to um, dismantle it to figure out how it was made so that they could start observing trends and see if it was all associated with the same threat actor because their goal was to neutralize the threat actor. Now, obviously in a military sense, when you say neutralize the threat actor, it has a very different meaning than to have a a commercial sense. But I think that there's a lesson to be learned here in that uh, financial institutions, retail institutions, other organizations that are regularly being uh, where the threat actors are engaging with them, we are doing ourselves a grave disservice by thinking that we can just, you know, fob off their attack. We'll just brush it off and not learn anything from that experience. Because you're right, they're learning from us on the dark web. They're trading our information, not only our documents and personal information, but also those um, tools, techniques, and procedures that really help them to be effective in breaching organizations and individuals. We need to apply that same learning at every organization to prevent those uh, threat actors from continuing to breach our organizations. And with regards to the breach, right, what do you think the root cause of these breaches are? Money. That's it. It's, it's a purely, with the exception of APTs and nation states, and I'm sorry, if you're watching this and you're thinking, yeah, I deal with nation states all day, I'm sorry, that sucks. Those are awful to have to contend with. Um, but for the rest of it, it's pure economics. It's that like last year, uh, ransomware exploded on the scene. We had not, yet, not Petya, we had Petya, we had the horrible thing that happened with the NHS UK uh, and, and Maersk and all the other organizations where ransomware was able to gain a toehold on their network and then the company either had to pay up to maybe get their files back, certainly not in the case of not Petya, which was a cyber weapon, or alternatively, they had to... Um, invoke their backup procedures and to restore all of their files. Massive waste of human resources, massive waste of time. But the underlying driver there was economics. If you, if you pivot also, let's go to another industry, uh, healthcare. I, I work with clients in healthcare. Um, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, I think the study went, um, it was about $100 for a medical record. Right. So if you could get somebody, if you get my medical information, it'd be worth about $100 on the dark web. And if you go back about five years ago, it was maybe about $25. And if you go back about one year ago, it's about 50 cents. And so our regulations like HIPAA, for example, or high tech have got very stringent definitions of how we're going to protect patient data, which makes sense as a healthcare user. I, I enjoy that. Yeah. But at the same time, the threat actors have went, well, there's no money in it. So they don't need to dox us anymore. So what we saw last year was the um, 
dispersion of these ransomware into hospitals, which was clearly affecting patients' care. And this year, because we all got smart about ransomware, what are we doing? We're doing crypto mining. Why? Because that x-ray machine, that um, CAT scanner, that multi-function, multifunction printer, your, um, your x-ray server where all of your um, uh, electronic images are stored. It's got spare CPU, so let's go mine some Monero, right? The I, risk love, I love what you're saying because this actually happened. Cable TV set-top boxes were yeah. hijacked to mine Bitcoins. Yeah, and it's terrifying though when you get into a healthcare situation because that has the real risk of a human computer interaction that's going to go bad. Because if you're trying to do a, a, a I don't know, a brain scan um, and you're trying to get those data very quickly, if that machine is mining Ethereum, that's going to affect somebody's life. And that's where it's going to become really dangerous really quickly here. And it's not because the, the threat actors want to kill people, right? And, okay, nation states excluded. Um, but your, your typical garden variety threat actor is trying to make money because where they're at, this is the best perceived way that they can gain money. And if they're in a country that doesn't have extradition laws set up with the United States or with Canada or with the United Kingdom or other countries, um, that's where we're seeing there's a real monetary incentive that this is perceived as a career path. And so what we're seeing is we've moved past just standard criminal gangs and we've really moved into they look like little companies. They've got a sales organization. They've got a marketing department. They've got an engineering department. They've got a quality control department. Now they might be highly compartmentalized. So not everyone has purview and, and the ability to see the entire organization, but it is becoming, they're becoming very effective at uh, deploying their tools and selling them to other threat actors, obviously again, for profit. Wow, that's a whole new world that you just exposed that I had no idea existed. I'm sorry, that's, I hope it's not nightmare fuel for you. <laughs> well, the biggest nightmare that I have is when my daughter complains to me that the Wi-Fi is slow. So now you got me thinking, I wonder if that thing's mining Bitcoins for someone. You know, it's funny. I have, um, I have three kids and I have, uh, they've just gotten old enough to have mobiles and the Nintendo Switch. And um, I have a Sonos home uh, uh, theater system for audio. Really love it. And um, that thing recently with the FBI telling everybody to please, you know, toggle on and toggle off your routers because of the VPN filter got me to thinking too. So I actually went out and bought a, uh, an artificial intelligence based home security system that monitors weird behavior on my network between like my Sonos and my home security system or between uh, my son's Nintendo Switch and uh, a cell phone, because never those two devices should talk. And I think we're gonna see a lot more of that in a home setting, because the, uh, like you said, the DVRs that are mining Bitcoin, most consumers, I, I think I saw a statistic about 85% of consumers who own a game console don't know that it's a piece of, that it's something that they have to update from a software perspective, and they don't know how to update it from a software perspective. And so what we're doing with these devices, these routers, these gaming consoles, these mobile phones, these light bulbs, um, is we're providing an always on foot uh, portal into our home networks as well as our corporate networks that once a, a threat actor can compromise it's very easy to move laterally much like they would in a corporate setting and to do things like turn on your webcam right or turn on your alexa and start potentially recording data or turn on other devices in your home um, we've also have seen some very upsetting things in terms of cyber stalking where uh, if you've got a, I don't know, a central AC unit that's controlled with a mobile app where um, former uh, spouses or abusers will be able to actually turn on people's lights or their AC or unlock their doors as a way of harassing someone. And that's becoming, uh, it's potentially difficult to prosecute right now. This is one where the laws on the books really haven't caught up to the situational reality. But that's, that's the world that we now live in. Yeah. And, you know, that's why we're doing this program, because this technology changes every 15 minutes. It does. It does. So, you know, and if you could just uh, tell us a little bit more about that um, 
security system you're talking about, because this is something I agree with you will become more and more common as time goes by and people realize that, you know what, the standard internet firewall is no longer good enough anymore. Now we need artificial intelligence to actually monitor the communication. Why, like you said, why is that mobile phone communicating with my coffee maker? Exactly, exactly. And that's, that's kind of where we're moving. Um, just because, it, like, I've been in IT for a while, and I've been in cybersecurity since before the people in marketing came up with the term cybersecurity, and good on them for having come up with that term. And I've configured stuff on my network before. I remember having, you know, enterprise, enterprise grade firewalls sitting in my garage, because I didn't trust what I could get at a consumer level. But it becomes onerous and difficult to maintain. I just don't feel like having to every day maintain that. Or I had a device a few years ago, there was a dedicated hardware ad blocker specifically to prevent malvertising campaigns, you know, those where they inject JavaScript code or a malicious ad that uh, provides a drive-by download for you. And so I've um, basically said, okay, you know what, there's finally solutions in this space for consumers that, um, and there's only a couple of them right now, but they're all, you know, in that $200 price point that really sit between your uh, home router and your home internet connection, whether it's a cable modem or an, uh, a, I don't know, DSL line, if anybody still has those, or fiber if you're lucky. Um, and it really does do that inspection. And it's very similar to what we're seeing in the corporate space too, with the move to artificial intelligence. Because if you've got, if you think about your home, right, you've got one person, maybe two people, if you're lucky, who are really good at computer security, if you're lucky, and they actually pay attention to when the cable modem says, hey, there's a thing, right? Most people don't though. They don't, <clears throat> they just don't have the personal resources to do that. And the same thing happens in large corporations as well, where there simply are not enough people with enough time and enough training to pay attention when the light goes blank or when the sim alerts and says, hey, by the way, uh, somebody logged in and did something weird. Most actual, actually, most companies don't really have the capability to identify when something's gone weird, whatever that weird might be. It might be a compromised account. It might be a machine that's started a weird process at 3 a.m. and it's connecting to a, an Amazon S3 bucket overseas. Um, all of these aberrant behaviors is where we're seeing the deployment of artificial intelligence to really start doing, this is a baseline. The device that I have in my living room um, did the same thing. It said, what does my Sonos normally connect to, right? What does my cell phone normally connect to? What does uh, the Nintendo Switch normally talk to? You can do that in an enterprise grade too to say, what does an accountant usually do with their day? What does a, <coughs> excuse me, system administrator do with their day? And um, that's gonna be really effective in the future because the speed at which the attacks are occurring is moving past the point where humans are able to adequately investigate them all and actually uh, address all of the threats that come yeah. in. Yeah, and um, do you have any, uh, just any names of devices uh, to share with people? Oh, you mean the home devices? Yeah. Um, Norton makes one, the Norton Core router is one, and then there's the Bitdefender Box 2. Yeah, and it's, it's great to know because I just learned something. I, kn I know that this was something that people were talking about for the enterprise, but I had no idea that it was available for the home. Yeah, it's, it's really... Um, it's honestly, it's comforting to, to now admittedly, this is a situational occupational hazard, right? I have a lot of devices in my home. And when my friends come over to play board games, we actually have, you know, I have an open Wi-Fi network for them. I have no idea what they're bringing into my house, right? That's why I put them on their own isolated segmented network. But still, I like having that oversight so that I don't have to do it. I can focus on other things and move on with my day. Yeah. And, and by the way, I, you know, all of us have some kind of connected device in our house, especially uh, if you have Alexa. Alexa is a very popular device. Uh, many of us have smart plugs and smart light switches at the very least, right? Mm -hmm. um, and many of these devices are manufactured overseas because as consumers, we all love getting the cheapest product. Right. And these items are not made with security in mind. That is very true. And I think that that's really the ongoing threat for them, the internet of things um, in that 
there's no standard for uh, security. And a lot of the Internet of Things devices, your DVRs, your light switches, your light bulbs, both in the uh, commercial space as well as in the private, uh, in um, the consumer space, um, really are not being designed adequately with security in mind and often have got hard-coded credentials built into them. And that can lead to, you know, really bad outcomes. I'll go back to the VPN filter. I mentioned the FBI had asked us to toggle on and off our routers. Uh, last estimate I saw is about a half a million devices, um, conservatively now, may have VPN filter on them. Now, VPN filter is a multi-stage malware that allows both exfiltration of data as well as man in the middle attacks so they can see what you're doing on the wire. But the interesting thing about VPN filter, I've read the research papers on it, it has a built-in um, a built-in uh, self-destruct mechanism which would allow the threat actor to brick the device, basically to inject random byte code um, onto the motherboard into the memory so that when the machine reboots, it's dead. The challenge here is the VPN filter is not just attacking people on Comcast or on Verizon, just their cable modems, right? Small network routers, so a lot of those small businesses, coffee shops, the, uh, maybe your drug store, maybe your home improvement store, not your, not your big box stores now, but the mom and pop stores on, on Main Street could potentially be affected by this. Uh, and one day that threat actor could say, you know what, I'm just I'm ending the operation and we're going to shut everything off and a half million points of entry into the internet suddenly go dark. Um, that is really a nightmare scenario that we look at. Um, and that's one where because of the lack of agreement of the necessity for security in the IoT space, um, that's not going to really change. And I don't think that it's something where uh, we can legislate a solution. I think that you're right. People need to be willing to either pay a little bit more to have a secure solution or organizations that are manufacturing these devices really need to look at the social impact of their work and to say, you know what? It's worth putting an extra 50 cents into the device cost and eating it as opposed to the risk factor that we have of like a half million people or families or businesses losing their internet access one day. Or even worse, it, infrastructure. Uh, yeah, yeah, critical infrastructure. That's where we kind of see it in like the SCADA space and in the um, uh, power plants and similar uh, facilities where threat actors really have been doing a great job um, of being able to compromise not only devices, because devices are only, you know, sort of interesting. Maybe you can get a foothold on one or two devices. That's it's useful. But what they're really after is those administrative credentials, those credentials of the person who can log into all the servers or the credentials that can shut off all the power or they can reroute things. Those are the credentials that we're really seeing threat actors go after across the board. Because often, like I said, they're, they're associated with highly privileged, trusted individuals whose uh, behavior is not typically yes. seen as aberrant. They're on the server. They must be doing something important. They're doing their job. Why would we look after that? That's where I think we're going to see more of an emphasis than we currently have on auditing, but also in terms of large-scale uh, artificial intelligence-based data preparation, not intelligence creation, but at least data analysis. We know AI does pretty well to say, you know what, actually this user has started acting weird. They're not acting like their peer group. Maybe their manager should go talk to them. Maybe they should, uh, we should, you know, send this to a person to actually go evaluate that. Um, and th that kind of working model between AI and humans is important because it allows for an independent conclusion to be reached, but not to have an automated response. Um, automated response these days is still sort of like, I'm okay with it in my home, but I wouldn't want it in my business. It's okay if my Sonos device is trying to talk to an uh, Amazon bucket uh, in, um, in Russia, for example, that's not cool. Please shut that off for me. But by the same merit, if an employee, a critical employee, starts suddenly logging in at 3 a.m. and downloading files. You need to know about I that. I need to know about it, but I need to have a conversation with her because that's not necessarily a bad thing. If they're traveling or if uh, maybe their work schedule has changed, that's where you still do need to have that uh, element of human intelligence associated with this data. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it all boils down to the human element, really. Yeah. 
Um, you know, just one note, we we're talking about infrastructure. I just read a report literally minutes before we started chatting uh, that criminals have now found a way to spoof GPS signals. And, you know, if you think about it with autonomous vehicles right around the corner, what kind of damage could they do? You know, the, the, um, that's not a new hack, I'm sorry to tell you. It's not a new one. They've just figured out how to scale it a little better. And I don't think that autonomous cars, because I, I know the research report you're talking about, I want to take a step back and think about, so let, let, let's talk about an autonomous car. If you have an autonomous car and you can spoof the GPS and it does not have onboard collision sensors, yes, you can cause a traffic accident. That's bad. If, on the other hand, you take that GPS uh, spoofing device, you put it on drones and you deploy those drones over a cargo ship, you can reroute a cargo ship. That's worse. Because if you want to, say, capture all of the cargo on a given device, uh, on a given cargo ship, which are seeing a wide amount of um, autonomous behavior at this point so that we can have less people working on those ships, you could steal not one car, you could steal what, those things carry 100, 1,000 cars? I don't even know, right? You want to steal all the shipment for the next Apple iDevice? Easy, right? Um, and that's the, the threat that we're seeing, again, between these human and computer interactions where if you don't have either an independent set of sensors or a human uh, monitoring for aberrant and strange behavior, you are going to see these outcomes. Wow. So, Kane, what's next with regards to cybersecurity and cybercrime? Um, so, from a cybercrime perspective, um, it's not going to necessarily get better. I think that we still have got a ways to go before we really do manage to hit bottom. Um, and the reason for that, again, is just the economics of the situation. Right now, companies a majority of organizations see that cybersecurity is an unwanted form of insurance. Actually, AT&T's report on the subject um, earlier this year said that about 60, 60 to 70% of companies, instead of investing further in this year for cybersecurity, they were just gonna buy insurance products and go, eh, we give up, it's good enough, right? We'll just buy insurance because insurance companies clearly like paying out. I'm not sure they ever have tried this before, but that's currently the thought because they, companies, organizations realize they're going to get breached and threat actors realize there's still money to be made here. Until we can change that underlying economic argument where threat actors are no longer rewarded for uh, compromising systems, stealing people's personal information, stealing organizational data, stealing uh, nation state data, we are gonna continue to see these threats. I think that on the um, defender side, we're going to see a uh, in continued investment um, by both private investors as well as the stock market and startups that are working in this space. I think that that's gonna drive a lot of innovation. The question is whether or not companies will adopt it at a rate that really um, helps organizations defend against the cyber threat. And the, the thing about it really is, you know, it's, it's like running away from zombies at the end of the day, right? Your organization does not need to be the fastest organization on the block. You need to be faster than the one next to you if you want to survive. And that's how this works, is that threat actors are saying they want to go for the least effort, the cheapest entry point. Right now, the cheapest entry point, more often than not, is spear phishing. It's sending somebody a highly crafted message, either through social media channels or through email or maybe through voicemail and engaging with them and asking them for their password. And people still do this. They give it away and because they don't have multi-factor authentication enabled, you got to compromise right there. Um, all this talk about zero days, right? It's, uh, <laughs> that, that's highly specialized, honestly. It's, it's human behavior where we are still able to be convinced despite our best knowledge, that this is a legitimate question, right? So that's kind of where, where we're going to see um, the challenges for cybersecurity to either address that at a training and a policy, but also at a product level where, um, you know, I often get uh, login accounts. Actually, I've got a little device on my mobile that tells me where I'm logging in from. And I'm frequently logging in from overseas. Uh, even though I live in Bellingham, Washington, just the other day, I was logging in from Germany. Uh, it was kind of fun to see because I was like, all right, somebody else has got one of my accounts. But um, that's the type of solution that organizations need to deploy to effectively manage this threat. Because if you don't have that second level of protection on top of it, 
and you're not monitoring typical user behavior and you're not monitoring the use of privileged credentials, um, you're ultimately operating in, in the dark at that point. Yeah, and to your point about the multi-factor authentication, sometimes at, I would get a text message at 3 a.m. Your Amazon security code is 1234. Like, right. Right, someone's trying to get in. <laughs> Kane, this is all fascinating stuff. I mean, that was such a fascinating and stimulating conversation about cyber. Tell me, what keeps you motivated every day? Um, I'm fortunate to support a really talented team. And um, that's one of the things that I really get excited about is helping to develop the next, um, the next generation and future generations of cybersecurity leaders. That's something that I'm very passionate about. It's something that I've actually built institutional programs about to really highlight the work of uh, my team and my, um, my, my colleagues. Because in my industry, which is consulting, people don't buy from a logo, they don't buy from a brand name, they buy from people. And what they want to see is the individuals they'll be working with are more interesting than your standard like throw up, show up and throw up type consultant where they get the job done in a workmanlike fashion, but then they leave and it's not really an inspirational experience. I try to motivate my uh, team so that they're transformative figures for businesses and organizations so that they um, really get excited about the opportunity to work with them. Uh, and a lot of that, what I do is encouraging my team to work through social media, to become published authors, to become known speakers, because the highest compliment I can be paid really is for a company to say, hey, the only way we're going to do this project is if we've got Ian, right? If we don't have Ian, we're not doing the project, we're going to go somewhere else, particularly if they've never uh, seen Ian's work, if they've, or sorry, if they've never met Ian in person, but they've seen his work, maybe they saw him speak, right? When somebody comes to me and says that, that means that it's working because that, um, that individual is so valuable that companies are seeking out them for their expertise. And I just have the good fortune of being able to support them in their career development. Yeah, right. Is, isn't that the best thing when they actually want you for your reputation? Absolutely, yes. Great. You know, there's a statistic that many small businesses fail within the first year. Where do entrepreneurs go wrong? Um, I think it's, there, there's a few places that entrepreneurs go wrong. The first would be not thinking about having security, just not, you know, really thinking this, yeah, it'll all work out, right? Um, and I think about a study that I saw where, and I don't remember the specific statistic, but a lot of small businesses or entrepreneurial ventureships, once they get breached, they're done. That's just pretty much end of story. They are breached. They do not have the wherewithal or the insurance or the staff to recover from that breach. Um, that's one challenge. The other challenge that I see is not of enough of an emphasis on sales. You can have a really good product. You can have a really good marketing campaign. You can have really good engineering staff. You can have really good support staff. You can have really good accounting staff. If nobody's actually able to sell it, it's really not going to go anywhere for you. And I think that from an entrepreneurial perspective, um, make your first dollar before you leave your day job is one of those good pieces of advice that I've heard. Because just because you like doing something, just because you think something's going to be awesome, doesn't mean the market's going to necessarily agree with you. Kane, if you can go back in time and change something, let's say some, somewhere within the last 12 months, what would it be? It's an interesting question. I, I can think of um, conversations that I've had with a, uh, an organization um, that I'm currently uh, maintaining a partnership with and not having enough of an insight into their future um, plans for that organization where they were planning on taking their partnership program. I think that that would have been invaluable really to get a better perspective because if you're doing um, business partnerships, it's really invaluable to have a good sense of where they think their ship is going and where that matches your course and where that diverges from your course. Uh, and that's probably, you know, it's, it, it comes down to basic communications of making sure you're checking in, having regular calls, having regular touch points. Just make sure that the partner program that you've joined, especially if you're doing a sales partnership program or a technical partnership program, that there's joint bi-directional communications. 
Yeah, communications is is the number one, the prime directive of uh, business. Absolutely. Kane, who would be an ideal client for you? Um, I'd say organizations that are really looking to mature their cybersecurity um, stance are ideal clients. And the, the reason I say that is a lot of firms, um, and I, I can say this authoritatively, don't actually have any cybersecurity expertise at a board level. They might necessarily, they might have it at a tactical level, but they don't have it actually at a higher level. And there's this sense in the boardroom these days that we need to do cybersecurity. All right, well, what does that mean? There's much shrugging of shoulders and much frustration. And there's a lack of a strategic vision for not how do we just do a strategic project, but how do we actually build an effective cybersecurity program to look past the horizon, to look past the current set of zero day threats and to look past the current regulatory climate and say, what are those foundational elements that we need to get in to really take a proactive approach to cybersecurity um, to identity and access management, to governance, right? How do we actually run this, not in today's current lean IT cl- uh, climate with, you know, three staff members in two weeks, you'll somehow get it all done and then check the box and move on. I think that organizations that are really successful and that I've and my organization have helped be successful um, have taken that longer viewpoint and been able to say, okay, we want to start with an advisory engagement. We want to understand where do we stand relative to others in our industry? What are the best practices that we've adopted? What are the best practices that we've ignored? Or that what are those opportunities we have for improvement? And um, also not really wanting to be prescriptive in terms of what they want. Um, I have had a few customers over the years who have been, you know, cybersecurity experts, and it's cool to work with them because they can say, we need these things. And you go, yeah, that totally makes sense. You do need those things, actually. Um, And then there's a lot of them who read a magazine, or they saw some words, or, you know, they've got a general sense that this is the cool thing to do. No, 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 no. Let's actually talk, you know, don't go, it's, they've talked to a vendor, invariably, they went to a trade show, they saw a demo, but they didn't sit back and say, what are we really setting out to do here? What are we trying to protect? What are we trying to defend? What is our posture towards risk and towards threat. And the organizations that I enjoy working with the most have got that mature, longer viewpoint rather than the shorter, um, the, 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 the quick turn viewpoint. Because cybersecurity is not a fad. It's a not going away. It's not something that you can fix and forget. Um, it's something where you really do have to have that long-term organizational and cultural commitment. And uh, by the way, we have a question from the audience. Oh, okay, good. So Scott Schober, who's the CEO of Berkeley Veritronic Systems in Metuchen, New Jersey, and also a leading authority on cybersecurity. And Scott says, social media today is essential in business. Is there any danger in being too social on social media and sharing too much private information that cyber thieves might use against you? So that's a great question, and I'm I'm humbled that Scott thought to ask me. uh, I I really do enjoy Scott's work. Um, I I think that the big threat that we have on social, there's two. I, I can think of two, and I'm probably oversimplifying. And the first is something that I like to remind my staff, that everyone, every word you write Everything you put out, whether it's an email or a social media post, somebody is going to see it in the worst possible light, and they're going to read it in the worst possible way. And I think that that is a moderating factor when you're composing for social media, in that you do have to be sensitive to how people are going to look at that and how your words could be misinterpreted or taken out of context. And in a, in a business setting, not just in a, in a personal setting, that can actually cause reputational damage. I think that that's a real challenge there when you're encouraging, like I do, I, I encourage my team to write for social media to serve as an editorial throttle and to look at what they're saying, especially in long form and say, okay, was there another way you could do that? Is there a different way that you could write that so that it's more inclusionary or perhaps choose language that's less susceptible to misinterpretation? Um, The other risk that really can happen 
is information, and again, I, I support a team of consultants that travel nationally, um, is for them to publish information about where they're traveling um, after they've traveled there, great, that's fine, please do. If you've got a great photo of that, um, that office park in Italy that you were working at, or maybe you've got a, a great photo of um, you know, the New York uh, skyline, uh, the lower Manhattan skyline at sunset, cool, post that when you get home, don't post it when you're there. And the reason why is that because as people who travel um, and I support a team that's you know, often on the road, you don't wanna share that information because thieves who are smart are looking at that information as well as other signals and saying, you know what? Their house is probably empty. There's probably nobody at home or at least their front porch is probably empty and I can go collect all the neat stuff that they've got coming from UPS or from FedEx while they're away. Yeah, that was a great question. Especially what with it being travel season, right? Yeah. That's one of those that's, a, you know, I, as my staff go on holiday, I've been asking them, so please do send us photos after you get back. Don't send us the photos live. Please don't put them out on Twitter because we don't need to have that as a problem for people who, um, you know, who travel for a living. I think the other thing ultimately that organizations run a risk of, and this is one of those, there's not a right answer. There's just a lot of, uh, a lot of answers is, the tendency to not disclose what security solution you're using. So some companies take the policy that they have security solutions, but they can't say that they're using Centrify or that they're using CyberArk or that they're using FireEye or that they're using some other solution. And they're just you know, asked to say, well, we've got some kind of security. Other organizations uh, are far more open about that. I think that regardless of the stance that you come down on from saying which company you use, sharing configuration information, especially on forums, is a risk. So if you're saying, oh, yeah, well, we saw this technical problem, and the way we did it is we reconfigured it so that the process would run as administrator at all times, right? It might be a valid technical point you're making. It might be very contextually aware for the situation, right? One Google yeah. search and now. Yeah, one Google search and now the bad guy, the, the threat actor knows, you know what I want to go do? I want to go compromise that account right there because that's a winner. Admin, admin is the password. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You spell admin backwards, right? That, that Nobody's going to guess that. <laughs> Kane, how do people connect with you? Um, I'm on Twitter quite frequently. It's under uh, Kane McGladdery, no space in it. I'm on LinkedIn, also under uh, LinkedIn slash in slash Kane McGladdery. Honestly, the easiest way to find me though, just Google me. There's exactly one of me um, on so many levels, it turns out. And um, that's the easiest way to find me. If you want to find the integral partners, uh, again, just search for Kane McGladdery. You'll find that. I think it's either this first or second hit at this point. Um, and that's, you know, I've got my own website if you want to see other stuff that I've been up to as well. Great. And we'll put that in the show notes so people can just click on that and get right to you. Fantastic. Kane, do you have any parting words of wisdom that you'd like to share with the audience? Oh, boy. <laughs> you asked me the hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think the, um, I had a gentleman come to the door the other day, actually, and he was, uh, he was from Louisiana and he wanted to, uh, he'd formerly been a convict and uh, had gotten out and was trying to start his own business. And so he was doing door-to-door -door sales as a way to learn how to do sales. And I'll share with your audience what I shared with him in that there's not really a perfect time for anything, right? You, you don't, wait for the time to be right. There is no right time. If you want to go start a business or if you want to try an experiment in cybersecurity configuration, you don't wait. And, and the reason that I say that is that we only have got a certain amount of time. That's actually the only thing that we have to give. And nothing is a guaranteed success. So the only way you know that you're going to, that something's going to succeed is you go try it. And so I really encourage people to not wait to go try something, to just go try something, whatever that might be. Might be, you know, you're traveling for work, you go try a new restaurant. It might be you're a salesperson, you wanna try a new sales method for engagement. You're a, an engineer, you wanna try a new programming language. I think that you shouldn't wait, you should try it today while you've got time on your side and you're always gonna succeed in that. That's such a great point. Kane, Thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom. I really enjoyed having you. Abraham, it's been a pleasure. I'll look forward to the show and I'll look forward to future episodes. This is a great project you're doing. <laughs>